Hi, this is Steve Adubato. This, as you know, because you watch it every Sunday on News 12 Plus and a variety of other digital media platforms. This is Lessons in Leadership. I'm Steve Adubato. That's Mary Gam on the screen. Mary, how are you doing? I'm doing really well. How are you today, Steve? I'm great. By the way, before we introduce uh, Dr. Whalen from uh, Caldwell University, Mary, what's your favorite baseball team? Oh, the New York Yankees, of course. Yeah. Is there? I didn't think there I'm was another team. I'm just saying. This just, I, I wanted to wear it, but I'd have hat head all day, all right? But the other thing is, this has got to be the greatest of all time. This is my Yankee mask, and I want to thank Frank Brown, who is the audio czar in PBS. Hey, Frank, I want to thank you, buddy, for this. You are welcome, Steve. You're welcome. Frank, you think I should do it this way the whole time, or is it distracting? It's a little distracting, and I don't think you have anything to worry about at your house. Yeah, well, you don't know who's here. Um, listen, this is a great mask. I want to also really officially and actually thank Frank for real and remind folks, joke, jokes aside, leadership is about setting the right tone, and we are big on masks. And before we actually got on the air with Dr. Uh, Whalen, the president of Caudill University, uh, Matt, you had a mask on right before we started, right? I have one right here. I have multiple masks in my office, and uh, I put them on whenever I have a, one person in here or I have people outside. You have to model behavior. And I've told the senior leadership team, they have to model behavior. So, it's so it isn't just what we say, it's what we do, sir. That's correct. That is correct. Mary, let's do this. Um, I know that all the folks who make lessons in leadership possible have a mandated mask policy and they have safety first. I'll let folks know who those folks are who make Lessons in Leadership sponsor our great, and possible our great sponsors. Yeah, I'd love to take a moment to thank all of them. So we have Gibbons PC, they're a wonderful law firm, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, and then we have the Down Strategic Leadership Institute. And I'd also like to take a moment too, in case they wanna follow you and see all your interesting masks that you wear and hear about your golf game and all of that, they can follow you on Facebook at Steve Adubato, PhD, that's A-D-U-B-A-T-O, as well as on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Um, and they can also log on to our website at stand-deliver.com where we have a lot of great resources. They can find out about your books, uh, a lot of free articles there about a variety of topics. You know, you know how I knew that Dr. Whalen is a brilliant leader and scholar? First time I talked to him, was, he started quoting Lessons in Leadership, my book, and I thought, this guy's brilliant. Matt, you remember that? <laughs> I do remember that. <laughs> were you just making it up or what? No, we, were, we had a nice introduction. We actually talked, if I remember correctly, about almost a half a dozen books that we both read and all about leadership and ranging from uh, historians to military leaders to educational leaders. So it's about... So, so, so Matt, it, it, tell him, Matt, I'm sorry for interrupting. Good to Great, one of our favorites from Jim Collins. That's good. That's great. Emotional intelligence and leadership, Dr. Daniel Goldman, right? I'm sorry. I, I don't want to pull out my whole library. Hey, Matt, let me ask you this. In all seriousness about leadership and reading and learning and growing, one of the first things that struck me when you and I talked offline, you are succeeding a great leader up at Caldwell, uh, Dr. Nan Dr. Nancy Blotner, who's been a great friend. You come into this incredibly difficult situation as president of the university in the midst of the COVID crisis. You are an avid reader and lifelong learner, which is one of the chapters in Lessons in Leadership, being a lifelong learner. When did you decide you want to be a lifelong learner about leadership? You know, it's a, it's a great question. Um, I, I grew up in a bookstore. And so I, from a very young age, I would read just about anything. And I always loved history. And so I would like to say I've been you know, interested in leadership since I was a very young child. I think I really, um, during my, my education in college, found that you know, leaders in different areas, uh, colleges and universities, medical system, um, politicians, elected officials, they're the people who shape the future. And that's when I think I really began to, to become interested in leadership as, as, a, as a vocation, I think, um, because we, get, we have to learn from the past so that we can shape the future. And I think our teachers are, are people who are, uh, many of them have gone by, uh, but uh, we can still learn from them. 
to, to Dr. Whelan's point, what's so interesting to me is that in the world of higher education, obviously, you don't need me or Mary or anyone else to tell you how much things have changed and can, will continue to change. But one of the things that struck me, and this is real life experience, as a member of the faculty at Caldwell University, I've been teaching a doctoral course for educational administrators for several years. And Mary, we were planned to be in a room teaching a class. It was on media and crisis communication, and we were showing videos all in a class with 15 people getting their doctorates in educational administration. What happened, Mary? Change mm -hmm. of plan? Yeah, it was a change of plan. Sometimes you just need to roll with the punches and, and be, we call it strategic agility and make that change. You don't always have to stay the course just because you were planning on doing something a certain way. You could definitely go in a different direction, which we did, and it, and it was successful. But along those lines, Matt, here's the question. We did that as one of your adjuncts. You have full-time faculty members, you have staff, you have students, you have their families. How strategically agile do you constantly need to be as opposed to, this is my decision, this is what we're doing and we're moving forward? How flexible do you have to be? Every day you have to come in and evaluate the situation. In the past three weeks, we have had situations change from cancellations of athletic seasons day by day. We have had situations with our food services. We had an interruption in our food services that went virtually unnoticed. We had a pipe break, so we had to get that fixed. Every day when you come into your, to your, uh, to your office or to your campus or to your medical system or your university, whatever it might be, you're faced with whatever happened overnight. So you have a goal. You know what the long-term goal is, but you also have to have the agility and the nimbleness and the people around you who can help you um, deal with what the distractions are but also keep going towards the goal. So it's always that two-pronged approach. Deal with the distractions, whatever you have to do and, and to be nimble and, and deal with the, what that day is brought to you, but still approach your goal. And I think that's the challenge that many people face. Dr. Wong, talk about building a team because, and Jim, I mentioned in Jim Collins' book, Good to Great, and one of the themes that you and I also talk about offline is, and I've said this many times on Lessons in Leadership, that Jim Collins, a mentor of mine, um, without him knowing it, I just learned so much from him, is he said, listen, presidents of universities, people who run production companies, we're just the bus driver of a bus. The bus is the organization. Not everyone can get a seat on the bus, particularly in difficult times, because you need the best of the best. How do you assess talent quickly and decide who you're starting five or nine or 11, depending on what we're talking about, is going to be? That, that's a great question. Um, and I think the assessment begins with the initial conversation. From the moment I meet someone and begin to talk to them, whether or not we're talking about an employment opportunity, I'm looking at that person to say, how might they help me in, in, in that sort of pursuit towards the goal and adherence to the mission? So it's not always about the people you have to hire. It's about anyone um, that collective group and that collective wisdom that we can garner by talking to a lot of people, those who are assessing for a position, but also those outside our institution who we might just be talking to who have faced similar challenges. But it begins with the initial conversations to answer your question and how well the people adapt to some of your questions. I have a question I use in all my interviews, or really it's a statement, where I say this is a great place to work. You can work a half day every day choose any 12 hours you want. And, and that sort of, some people that throws for a minute and they sit back and say, wow. And some people lean forward and say, I'm in. And so that to me gives me that immediate feel for what that person will do when we are faced with those long days, those 12 and 13 and 14 hour days, because we will be faced with them as leaders. Not right. all the time, every day, but we have Mary, to jump in. Yeah, Dr. Wellen, it's interesting that you talk about that. We found um, we have a very small team here. How do you handle those team members, though, that don't lean in, that don't, uh, we just say they're, they're resistors. They, they constantly like to say no or roll their eyes or shake their head. How do you get them to buy in, to believe um, in, in your mission and the vision and the goal of, of the university? So I think, first of all, everybody gets a chance. Everybody, when you come into a new, org new organization, you will hear about what people think about this person or that person, and you will hear everybody's past um, uh, experiences with that person. But as a new leader with me, everybody gets a chance. 
And when I find that resistance, I try and find what the reason is for that resistance. And sometimes there is a, a uh, reason that, that just is built into the structure that person is faced with. And if there's a good way to get rid of that, 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 that structure, that obstacle really, we can deal with that. If there's just an inherent unwillingness to be on the, uh, on the, on the leading edge to do things, that's a problem. And that's when we have to deal with things and, and see if there's other opportunities that that person might want to pursue rather than be in the position they're in. Because we're building a team, we're building a team of people who say we can do this and I want them in the right position and need them in the right position at the right time. Uh, Matt, I, uh, Doctor, we got about a minute left. Question, what would you say the number one leadership? You've talked about a lot of them already and we ask everyone this, but it's important. The number one leadership lesson you've learned particularly in this challenging, difficult, uncertain time? Trust your team. You have to be able to build and trust your team and create a team that, that can be nimble. So, so if you, no one does it alone, Steve, you know that. Um, and so we have to be able to build a team, to trust the team and move forward, keep them as we drive the bus headed towards the goal. We might have to take a different route to get there, mm. but we we'll have to listen to the team and help us help us drive that bus to get to the goal. Well said, um, Dr. Matthew Whelan is the president of Caldwell University. I'm proud to be a part of that university. And I've said this before, and I think I said it to Dr. Whelan when I talked to him, was there were, I believe, 15 students in that course, Mary, all are, they are either superintendents or principals, or they're major leaders in public uh, education and non-public education. And talk about the challenges as we do this program. Think about this that Caldwell University is teaching those folks to be the best leaders they can be in the world of education, with the decisions they have to make, with the stakes being so high. Um, it is being an honor just being around those folks. Talk about being on the front line. They are every day, along with the teachers and the staff who work for them. Hey, uh, Dr. Wellen, thank you so much for joining us on Lessons in Leadership. We look forward to many conversations with you about this and other topics. And also, good luck in... Uh, in this relatively new position where the challenges will face you every day. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Steve. Mary, thank you. And I look forward to seeing you on campus here at Caldwell University very soon. A lot to be said for teaching on, on campus where you can actually do it. I'm Steve, that's Mary, that's Matt. We'll be right back right after this. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. That's stand-deliver.com. This edition of Lessons in Leadership is brought to you by Gibbons PC, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, and the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825. Welcome back to Lessons in Leadership. Steve Adubato with my colleague, Mary Gambit. Mary, uh, the most significant takeaway for you from the interview with Dr. Matt Wellen, the uh, president of Caldwell University. Dr. Whalen really hit a lot of uh, things home for me. First and foremost, he talked about the importance of building your team and really making sure, as you and I always say, that you have the right people on the bus, the people that are willing to go all in, believe in the mission and the vision and the future of the way you're taking your organization. And he just really shared a lot of tips and tools about the importance of a team because as we all know, you cannot do anything alone. Micromanaging doesn't work. And uh, saying that if, if I don't do it, it's not gonna get done right. That just doesn't work either. The other thing that was interesting, and we'll talk about this in a, in a future Lessons in Leadership show. Um, uh, we did this fascinating, unscripted, no one prepared for it. We took three of our youngest producers at our uh, production company, the Caucus Educational Corporation. We had, um, it was Nicole, Michaela and Erica, and I said, listen, let's talk about leadership, what you've learned about leadership, and one piece of advice for me, which was a mistake to do, and they said, trust us. They kept saying, trust us, and I heard Matt Whelan say, trust. Uh, Mary, I'm, I get the trust part, but I'm a big trust but verify person. What's the difference? Trust but verify means if, if you say to somebody, I want to get an update on where we are with the XYZ Jones project, that means that I, you need to make sure not only that you trust that you're going to get that update, but then you verify, okay, by when, who's going to handle it? 
Because if not, if you blindly trust, that's when things are going to fall through the cracks. Uh, but to follow up on the point that you were just making about that conversation with the younger staff when they're talking about trust us, you and I have shared all the time, I say, give the benefit of the doubt. And it's a leadership, <laughs> oh, don't laugh, you know I'm right. <laughs> benefit, of doubt, benefit of the doubt, about what and about whom? About anything that potentially could go wrong. So, so even sometimes before things go wrong, you and I have talked about the fact that, you know, you need to give each of the team members, I always say to my boys, I'm going to trust you. You know, Will went out last night and he's, you know, walking home. It's fine. It's all good. But I said, I'm going to trust you until you give me a reason to not trust you anymore. And that's what benefit, benefit of the doubt is. And if, and it's not to say that trust is going to be broken forever, but until there's a reason to doubt then you need to believe in your team because you put them in those roles to succeed. And if you don't give them your confidence, then they are going to feel insecure and that's when mistakes are going to be made. Okay, the Pandora's box you just opened is massive. And the problem <laughs> is we have to go to Brian Granulati. That was all who, part of my master plan. So well, we didn't argue you, back Mary, and forth. Because one of the things you assume in your argument, and I said I wasn't gonna get into it, but I can't help it. That's what you do, you provoke me. So. It isn't only a question whether I trust whether your intent is there to get it done. You have the ability often to get it done. But the verify part is confirm that you have done it. I'm not going to trust that you did it and wishful thinking and I hope that it gets done. That's not leadership. I didn't and say I though. No, but I didn't Mary, say that I'm we're not, not going to verify. I don't trust the person that their intent's not there and their desire's not there. I'm saying mistakes get made along the way. Mistakes of omission, mistakes of lack of experience, mistake of, oh, I thought that's what you, I thought you meant this. Oh, you meant that? So when I say I don't trust, it's not that I don't trust our people. I don't trust that things will get done as they need to and they have to until they're verified. Why does that bother you? Because when, and I agree with you, verify, make sure that the person understands what the task is. When I talk about benefit of the doubt, it sometimes you'll jump to the fact that something did go wrong or if it did go wrong, you know, the reasons why. And sometimes if you give someone the benefit of the doubt of hearing why a thing was done a certain way, you have that aha moment and you may see things a little bit differently. That's all. But I agree okay. with you. You need to verify. Uh, no different than confirming guests for this great show that we do together. You need to verify that they receive the link, that they know they're going to yes. tune in, get a number in case they're not there. All of that, definitely, I agree with completely. Last thing on this before we go to Brian Granulati, the CEO of uh, Atlantic Health System, is this. I'm not a fan of team members, whether it's our team or anyone else. You give an assignment, it's got to be done, and they'll say something like this. We got it. We, 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 we've got it. No, Who's you and I agree it? with that. You know, I Who's agree wholeheartedly. Now, we're a team on this, and I always say the same thing. Who's the quarterback? Who's the leader? Who's the point person? Who do I go to to find out where things are? And if, God forbid, things go wrong? No, no, we're a team. When someone keeps saying we're a team, we do it together, that's diffusing leadership, diffusing responsibility and accountability. And I know we're a team, but who is the person? That's agree. what, when I don't hear it, I don't trust. I'm sorry. I know, but did you hear what I said? I said, I agree. I'm not used to it, so I didn't hear it. <laughs> um, hey, listen, set up Brian Granulati real quick, Mary. Sure. We're going to be, uh, you did a great interview with Brian Granulati. He's the president and CEO. Sorry, I know I just put that in front of the camera there, Elvin. That's all right. Uh, president and CEO of Atlantic Health Systems. So we're going to throw to that right now and we'll see you in a minute. Let's hear Brian. We're talking leadership with um, a leader who's been dealing with a whole range of difficult challenges. We'll continue to uh, every day. He's Brian Granulati, president and CEO of Atlantic Health System. Brian, good to talk with you. Thank you. Brian, um, as a student of leadership, I know you are as well. How has COVID-19, the reality of it, we're actually taping this in mid-June, how has it in any way altered, changed, impacted your view and approach to leadership? Yeah. You know, um, I am so proud to work with the 17,000 people here at Atlantic because what I saw was a level of engagement, a level of uh, resiliency, and an absolute focus on uh, caring for our communities in ways that um, I would have only dreamt of. I knew we were good. I didn't realize we were that good. And I go back and think about, well, why 
is that the case? Why were we able to uh, respond the way we responded? And I think it really comes back to staying focused on three important things. One is how do our decisions affect our patients? And I saw examples over and over again where that was the centerpiece of everything we did. I was rounding at Morristown Medical Center the other day and I was in the ICUs and that ICU is now uh, no longer has COVID patients in it. Right. But the nurse, As we're doing this program right now in the middle of June, we hope it stays that way. Right. <laughs> um, but the nursing team were telling me about all the innovations that they did in partnership with their colleagues in engineering, partnership with biomedical engineers, respiratory, ther ser respiratory therapy services, and they completely con reconstructed um, the teams that were, were providing care. Because when you quadruple your ICU capacity, you don't have enough intensivists. You don't have enough critical care nurses. And so team members from all over our organization stepped up to take on different roles and ended up working under the direction of a skilled clinician like an intensivist. And you had cardiologists who were providing care and you had other types of physicians who maybe didn't have that kind of training, but they were taking that guidance. And the same thing occurred on the nursing side. So the second thing that we stay focused on here is how do we care for our team members? And one of the most gratifying things that I have heard from so many of our team members is that they felt that we did everything we could to protect them. Because this is a scary virus. It's a scary virus. And it, you can't compartmentalize it because it affects you whether you're in your community or at work. And we did everything to make sure that we had the right protective equipment, that we had the right number of team members. We didn't lay anybody off. We did not furlough anybody. No. Um, and we made a conscious decision to do that because we felt that this was going to be an all Atlantic effort. You know, a funny story on that is, um, you know, we, we are the, 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 the sponsors of the Jets, and we do a lot of the work. The New York football Jets. Yes. They have and, a practice uh, facility up there, right? Yes, they do. And uh, so we provide uh, a lot of services for them. But a couple of our trainers, um, you know, when we went through the forced shutdown of, of different types of care um, to create capacity, a couple of our trainers decided that they would become environmental services workers and be part of the team that would move with the patients who had COVID to the areas that they needed to go to for their diagnostic tests uh, or their procedures. And they scrubbed every place down where those patients and team members went, the elevators, the hallways, and they did that for weeks and they became part of that care team. So you ask yourself, you couldn't have put that in a plan book, right? How do, you, how do you get people to mobilize around that? And it's just creating this sense of purpose that it's about our patients and it's about each other. And the other thing that we focus on here at Atlantic then are the resources. But what we said is we will deal with the resources later. We have to figure this issue out. Now, fortunately, we've been able to uh, work through some of the government programs and we appreciate the support that we're getting. We need more, but we appreciate that support. So um, I think that we've just had uh, an amazing uh, output here, and I'm just very, very proud of our team. Brian, one, one other quick follow-up question on leadership. I've asked virtually every leader we've interviewed for this series um, about how they deal with their own fear and anxiety and insecurities and uncertainty and all that and the importance of, quote, not letting your team see that no matter what you're feeling. And as a leader of a small not-for-profit, as well as a leadership development company, you're sitting there going, who owes us what? Are they going to pay? How can they pay if they're laying people off or dealing with all kinds of issues? Are we going to get new clients, sponsors, whatever? So I'm dealing in the middle of the night doing math on a budget and saying, why do we have to lay off different, more people? What do we do? but I don't want our people to see that I am anxious. How do you, do you hide that? 
Or do you not experience it like the rest of us? <laughs> um, I struggle, like we all do, with balancing that. So your, your commentary is, is exactly kind of the normal human condition that, that we all experience. But one of the things that I have tried to do in my in, entire career is stay based on the principles. And I have a plaque in my office that was given to me by the leadership team after uh, my first CEO position when I was moving to another organization. It was called Granulati's Golden Rules. Granulati's Golden Rules, go ahead. Right. And it was three questions that I asked always um, about any complicated issue. How does it affect our patients? How does it affect our team members? And how does it affect our numbers? And it's in that order. Numbers third. Numbers are third. Not first. Not first. Because? If you do the first two right, the last one's going to work. And that has been my experience my entire career. And um, it didn't change in this effort. Um, now, um, some would argue that that's blindly naive. Um, so far, it hasn't been. Uh, it's worked. Because unless you have a purpose and unless you are a leader that has your team members backs and try to stay focused on that you can make a lot of money but the minute something bad happens everybody's going to go out the door um, and i found that to create this culture of caring um, you got to stay focused on that. That's probably why I'm not in private equity and I'm probably not an investment <laughs> banker. So. Well said, Brian Granulati, president and CEO of uh, Atlantic Health System. Thanks so much, Brian, all the best. Thank you. Yeah, that, that was Brian Granulati, the uh, president and CEO of Atlantic Health System. Mary, I was struck by Brian talking about creating a culture of caring. N easier said than done, right? It is so much easier said than done. As a leader, you're focused on so many different things. You need to see everything from the you know, 50, 60, 70,000 mile level. However, you need to zero in because at the end of the day, it's your people and your team who are gonna be there and you need to show them that you have your, their back as well. And that's the point that he had raised that just really um, struck home. You know, it's so interesting. It's, it's critically important in a hospital setting, uh, an educational setting. If you ever go into a department store, and again, we all have to wear a mask as we speak right now, or you go anywhere and you can sense that people on the team don't care very much. They really are just going through the motions. And I think, who created that? Is it on the employee who's on the front line or is some leader along the line not really help to create that culture or I'll complicate it even more? Are there some people who just, they don't care that much? It's a combination of both. It definitely, leadership definitely is from the top down. If the leader doesn't care about his team, how is his team going to care about the organization and the clients or the patients or the customers? So I think it needs to start at the top, but it sure helps a heck of a lot if your team and the people that you bring onto your team really care, because we've talked about it a lot. Caring is something that you really cannot teach. You either care or you don't. Yeah, absolutely. And on that note, uh, Mary, I want to thank you and our our team behind the scenes who gets things done every time it takes a team with Elvin and Frank and Nick and, uh, and Sylvester. I want to only leave out Sylvester on the back end who does extraordinary post-production and editing. Uh, people think, hey, you have that leadership show, Steve. I've seen it. Yeah. Check out all the people who get the show done. I'm the front person along with Mary, except she does extraordinary work in making things happen as well. Mary, that's it. I just wanted to thank everybody. That's it. That's all I have. What do you have? Yeah. We gotta yeah go. no, thank, thank you to everyone as well. Sylvester, the team, and Frank, and Amy, who does our closed captioning. It's amazing how much goes on uh, behind the scenes. And thank you for being such a great host. I totally agree. We'll see you next week. <laughs> this is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. That's stand-deliver.com. This edition of Lessons in Leadership is brought to you by Gibbons PC, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, and the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825.